right. All right. So. Uh, we have our guest speaker today is Ms. Heidi Thomas. Heidi Thomas is the, I say, the premier uh, cart caption provider for, one of the premier cart caption providers, I should say, for the U.S. Um, she is a alumna of Brown College. She has a lot of letters behind her name. She teaches cart captioning for veteran court reporters in the industry. Uh, Heidi is a very important resource for the school. She's on the advisory board for Brown College, as well as she takes students on mentorships and things like that. For um, if you're interested in card cash, and she's just really a good mentor. Machine or voice doesn't matter. She's a good resource for you guys to uh, reach out to, ask questions about the industry and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I was about to tell a story about Heidi. And as a matter of fact, I will tell the story about Heidi. I got in trouble with Heidi. The reason why I call her the pre one of the premier card caption providers for the United States is because I got uh, I didn't want to bother Heidi because I was always calling Heidi. Can you take this student? Heidi, can you take this student? And Heidi, uh, so I, instead of bothering her, I looked up card caption institutes or card caption firms. Found one in Illinois. I emailed that particular uh, place. I called them up and asked them, they didn't reply back to me. Heidi called me. And Heidi said, Mark, what are you doing calling Chicago? So that's why I called Heidi the premier person in the United States. <laughs> Chicago's calling me, and they're saying, I thought you were uh, the person in Georgia. And I said, Heidi, I'm sorry. She said, Mark, if you ever need anything card caption related, you call me. So without further ado, here's Ms. Heidi. Thank you. <laughs> a lot to live up to. Thank you. <laughs> the only reason I call is because I'm I work for about 15 different companies, and um, that's one of the companies I work for. So, and whenever anybody calls a national company to do something in Atlanta, it doesn't really matter which national company it is. They usually I'm one of the people they call or email or something. So you can hire another company, but I'm probably just going to show up anyway. Um, so, well, hi, and I am truly a Brown College graduate. This is 41 years ago. Whoa, I know. And I was only 12. Um, uh, but yeah, 41 years ago, it was, the school was next to Kmart around the back of Broadview Plaza. Anybody remember Broadview Plaza if you're a native Atlantan? Yeah, that's where we were when I graduated. Um, just a little one hall. Uh, there were a couple, uh, probably a couple of your teachers were here at that time. I won't tell on them who they were. Um, but anyway, I started out as a deposition reporter in 1978. Worked because that's kind of what you did. Uh, and then I went over to Hughesby and Associates and worked there, and I went to Esteb and Associates and worked there, and then I established my own just small firm, just me, and then I became a partner in Regency Reporting, which is now Regency Brentano, and worked there till I, I sold my interest back to them in 93. But in the meantime, in 1989, I had the opportunity to caption for our local NBC affiliate, WXIA, Channel 11. They had a contract at the time. They were the sixth local market in the entire country that had live captioning. Back then, nobody had live captioning. There were maybe 25 of us who did this, maybe? I don't know. So I started, and I would just, I just did that part-time. I would go down. You ha we had to go down there to the station to work at that time. Um, now I get to work out of my home or... I can go on site, but most of the, all the, the broadcasts you see, probably 95% of it is somebody from their home studio working. Um, but I used to go down to the station, and I would caption the 6 and 7 o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news, and um, we had a studio down there. I knew all the people, all the anchors and the talent, and we were next to the sports department, and so I would just go hang out at Channel 11 a few nights a week, and after a few years of being a depot reporter by day and a captioner by night, 
I did that about two and a half years and decided, oh, yeah, and then I had these two children, those guys. Well, when I started on the air, one of them was five months old and the other one was uh, two. One of them has his own children now. Um, so I really wasn't doing anything really well. I decided I loved the captioning, though. I did. I loved it. But there wasn't a lot to do back then. So um, I went into business with uh, Judy Brentano, and we started captioning as much as we could. But at that time, there, like I say, there just wasn't that much. But through the years, I, that was, has been my passion, and I have captioned live television for probably most every network there is because I've been around a while and I always say yes can you do this sure I'll try and I always worked for a small company so it was one of those things where when something came in the door that's what you did that's what you did and that's what you got good at because there was nobody else to do it and so we just uh, did a variety of different captioning assignments, national, um, local. We'd go on site and do classes. That was back when if you wanted to be a cart captioner, you really, most of that was like on site and you'd follow students around and you'd walk all over Emory University's campus with your stuff and follow students. And, um, and so that's how I started out and I'm still doing all kinds of cart and captioning and broadcast captioning. I don't do as much anymore because I like the more daytime weekday hours now. And broadcast captioning, most of the live stuff, if you notice, is prime time, sports, entertainment, news. So it's nights and weekends. And um, I, so I, I got out of doing mostly broadcast after about 15 years. And now I do a lot of cart captioning and I get to travel. I've been to probably eight different countries to do international conferences. I, I have a week-long gig coming up in Orlando. I, I've been to, I don't know, I went to San Francisco last year. I, can't, I have to look at my calendar to remember all the places I go. Uh, and I'm an independent contractor. So there's one thing I get to say, and that's nope. I'm sorry, can't go busy but I love to travel so if you ask me to go to another city or another country I'm probably going to go and I my kids are grown now I have grandkids they live here in the city but I am I'm not married anymore so I can go pretty much whenever you need me to and I love to travel so it I, I'll just tell you that there's just so much you can do with with your machine or your voice or whatever it is you're doing and, and, and don't let people tell you that voice writers can't be captioners because that's not true. There are, there are voice writers who are captioners and um, don't let folks tell you that this is a dying profession. It's not. It's going to be around a long time. There's still no one that can do this job like a human. We're, we're far superior to whatever technology there is because there's so much we have to deal with and so much thinking we have to do that artificial intelligence can't. But I'm going to tell you about something that happened recently and, and then I'm going to take your questions if you have some because if you don't, Art, you guys know, I can stand up here forever and talk to you. So you might need to ask a question in self-defense because I love what I do and I'll just talk to you about it forever. Um, I was just recently captioning a conference out of Geneva, Switzerland. And it was the group of folks who govern the internet in the entire world. I mean, like, these are scary, smart, important people. I don't know them, but they are scary, smart, important people. And there was a gentleman who was, he was part of a panel, and he got up to make his presentation. He's from, I think he's originally from Norway. He's got a business now in New York. And he evidently is one of the leading authorities on artificial intelligence. I, I don't know. I'm sure people in the industry know who he is. And he starts, he starts his presentation, and I have a, a video. I can see him on video. It's pretty far behind, so I can't caption off the video. I'm captioning off audio. But I can see the video, and I can see the screen up there. I, he's like here, and the screen's up here, and I can see my captions. It's a whole screen of text. 
and clearly he can see them too. And he starts giving his presentation on artificial intelligence and tells everybody how great it is now. And see those words? See how good it is? Because no human could possibly type that fast. Excuse me? What? And I'm sitting there in my home beating my head against the wall trying to write what he... Okay, well, I won't tell you what I said. And I couldn't, I couldn't put anything up on the screen. I wanted so bad to go, no, it's not. This is a human. Hello. But I can't. And um, so here he is telling this audience as a premier leading expert at AI that this has to be AI and look how great it is. Yeah, well, it's not. And when we caption Microsoft conferences, we'll, nobody can see us, and people from the audience, you'll hear them go, oh, wow, this, this automatic captioning is great. And they'll, and they'll go, yeah, it is. No, it's not. It's like a person. So we deal with that a lot. So even, even folks who are experts in their industry, they sometimes give themselves a little bit too much credit for what AI can do. I'll tell you right now, AI is not going to take my job in my lifetime. I don't really think it's going to take your job in your lifetime. I don't know what's going to happen over the next 30 to 40 years, but there's a long way to go. And I was told 41 years ago that tape recorders were going to take my job. We've been told this for years, right? I mean, that's, the, that's what we've all been told since the beginning of time. Well, why don't they just... Why don't they just record it? Well, do you have an hour? Because there's a lot of reasons why don't, they don't just record it. So, you guys, we really need you, <laughs> like really badly. I talk about my work everywhere I go. I just did a gig. Um, I had to go down to Sea Island for the weekend. It was terrible. <laughs> Darn. I had to work at the Cloister for two days. It was just terrible. And I'm working with the uh, AV guy, young, young guy, and he's been doing, he's there, he's got a sweet job, but he saw what I did, and the folks who were there saw what I did. And for two days, people just came up and said, that is so amazing, and you guys will get this too. What is it, that little machine, or what are you doing with that thing? What? Um, and I talked to him about it, and he went to the Z program online to see, to see if could sign up for that to see if he likes to write. He, he's very interested now in what we do. There's a lot of people. Um, I, I know, how many people this is, this is maybe your second career? Or, okay, perfect. Um, and and you, there's not age discrimination in this work. There's just not. You don't show up and you're too old. I don't know anybody that's ever looked at a court reporter or a captioner and said, wow, no, oh, they're 45. They're 50. They're 50. Mm. Let's hire the young one first. No. What they say is, oh, great. We are so glad you've had some life experience. Come on down. We love you. Um, and it, it's just so, it, and you don't start and work your way up. You get paid the same as everyone else does when you first start out. You're not able to generate the pages that someone who is experienced can generate as a court reporter, and you're not able to take as many shows and do as many different things as a captioner, but you get paid the same thing. You don't have to work your way up. So it's it's just, it really is, I mean, I, I know everybody's got those naysayers in their lives. That school's taking your money, and when are you getting out of school anyway? And how long is it going to be? And that's what you said last week, and, and why is it going to take that long? And when I tell people about this job, they'll go, oh, well, I would love to do that. And I'll go, what's well, about three years? Three years? Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's, this is hard. Why do you think we need people? I said, if this was something easy that everybody could do and everybody wanted to do, we wouldn't need people. I said, this is a six-figure six income, and you don't need a, a college degree. This is a really great. I said, this isn't a job. It's a profession. It's a career. So, it, you know, they go, well, I thought I could do it in six weeks. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. All right, I'll stop here because I see this question here. Tell me. Yes, 
So tra- I, I love to do the traveling. Um, oh, I need to get back on frame. Sorry. That's rude. Hey, sorry. Sorry, everybody. Yikes. I'm not used to that. I'm like, oh, dear. And I sway back and forth, too. I'm going to try to stand still. This is hard. This girl likes to move. So when I travel to di- other countries, it's generally for an, um, an international conference. And I'm generally not captioning, for, uh, not captioning as much for folks with a hearing loss as I am for speakers of other languages. Because generally at these, uh, at these conferences, there's, there's people from like 190 countries. So there's every language on the planet spoken there. And they generally have, uh, you're allowed to present and the official languages are usually, there's usually six official languages. English is b- being the main one. Sometimes they'll default to English if there's not an interpreter there, but there's interpreters in interpreting booths. And so what I do is I listen to the English channel. So if someone speaks English from the podium or if someone speaks uh, English from anywhere in the room, I will hear the English. If someone speaks French or German or Russian or whatever one of the other languages is, then automatically it will switch in my ear to the English interpreter and I'll listen to the English interpretation. So I'm always writing English to English. And we put, and we put up English, and so f- speakers of other languages, sometimes they are able to, when they hear English, even though it's not their first language, if they can read it at the same time, will be able to retain it and understand it better. Does that make sense? So it, it works, and that works that way even for captions on television. I know folks who are trying to learn English as another language will quite often turn on their captions on TV to help reinforce that. And it's a really great tool if, if you're trying to teach kids to read and they want to watch TV. All those words constantly in front of their face, it can't hurt. And if they're used to it, it won't distract them. Well, kids are, kids are distracted. They live distracted. Uh, so they're not going to notice it. So that's, you know, it, it, we serve more people than just those with hearing loss. Then I, when I travel in, within the United States, it might be a convention. The one I'm going to in Orlando is a Microsoft, giant Microsoft convention. I've done a lot of conventions for them. And sometimes it's a conference that is specifically disability related, or it might be specifically deafness, hard of hearing related. It just depends. It might be that somebody who belongs to the American Economic Association and is an economist and has a hearing loss, wants to go to a conference. Sometimes I sit next to the person and provide services one-on-one. Sometimes I put captioning on a big screen for the entire room. Sometimes I integrate with the video, and it looks like captioning on TV with the two lines at the bottom. So sometimes I'm backstage with a headset on. Sometimes I'm right next to the person that I'm working for. It just depends. And the point of all of that is that I need to know how to make all this happen. If I'm going to work one-on-one, how am I going to get that information to my consumer? I need to know how to do that. If I'm going to, if I'm going to get the information to a group of people, how am I going to get it to them? Okay? So there's technology involved with what we do. But the nice part is we get to focus on the writing part. I don't have to make transcripts. Um, which it was fine. I mean, I enjoyed the process when I did it. but. We all know we love writing on the machine or using our voice. That's what we love about this work is the actual taking it down. So I get to concentrate mostly on that, which I love. Did that answer your question? Okay, I'm going to go back here and then. Hi. Thank you. I really am. It's very honest. Yes, it's all real time. How, what's the parallel like to the machine as opposed to the voice writing? I'm, we're, I'm fairly new at this, so I'm still attempting to lay down um, good products, and sometimes it seems like it's just trash, trash, trash. So are you a voice writer? Are you a voice writer? Yeah, okay, well, what I can tell you is, in my humble opinion, whether you are a voice writer or a machine writer, whether you are a judicial reporter slash court reporter, or you are a captioner, when you leave this school and you go out into the world, you need to be writing real time, 
period, end of sentence. That's how you are. That's how we're going to keep this profession alive because that sets us apart from machines, okay? It's the real time. So I want you to concentrate on the real time. That, to me, now, you bring 15 different core reporters or captioners in here and you're gonna get 15 different opinions. This is not, you know, in my perfect world, in the world according to Heidi, you need to be a real-time writer. I don't care if you're a voice or machine. You need to write real-time, period, in a sentence. So, if you're writing real-time and you have good translation, that means you've put in a lot of work. That's what it takes. It takes a lot of work. It tr as, a, as a voice writer, you've got to do a lot of training of your system. And you've got, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of little things that you've got to do. And as a machine writer, ha hold your hand up in here if you're a machine writer. Okay. So machine writer, voice writer, it's all about doing the little things that it takes to be a real-time writer and not just be able to get something down on your machine or with your voice. And it will, co it will come. It seems really impossible at the beginning, doesn't it? Like, re like really impossible. Seriously. I mean, I, I totally remember when I was in like theory and 80 and 100 class, I went to a school, it was kind of like this, and there were like windows next to the doors in the classrooms, and I would press my nose against the window in the back of the room of the like the 200 class, right? And I'd watch them, and I'd go, that's just a lie. Nobody can do that. That's just stupid. Why, why do I even think I could, because you, you're convinced you can't. You can't, though we all do. How does it happen? It just, it happens in little baby steps because you will get there and you'll be able to do it. Voice writers sometimes have a little bit, a little bit larger curve for the training because you guys deal with more artificial intelligence than we do in what you do. Artificial intelligence is gonna take over with your system before it's gonna take over with mine. I can tell my system, I don't want your artificial intelligence. It doesn't guess at just because this word is this, it's not going to say, oh, I think this is what you meant. Okay, we can, we don't have to, we can take that out. But because of your system, and, it, and it's not good, bad, or indifferent, it's just the way it is. So you guys have to, you, you guys have a little bit more to overcome so that artificial intelligence doesn't take over and do something you don't want it to do. If I write the same outline the same way, 100% of the time. It will 100% of the time translate as that word if I write it the same way. You guys, it might, you know, take this word and that word and decide from context, well, this word needs to be that. You clearly did not say that word, really clearly. You said it the same way you said it yesterday. Yeah, but it wasn't with those other two words. Maddening. That doesn't happen to us, okay? It, it's, so you sometimes have a few more things to overcome. Um, and, and there are some people, and I know you guys have experienced it because I've been in this industry for over 40 years and here in Georgia we're half machine and half voice. But a, I know every single one of you knows at least one person or have heard of a machine writer who somehow thinks that it's special or more more special or, or better than a voice writer. I don't happen to hold that opinion. I, I say we all do the same job. We're all capable of doing the same job. And there's really fabulous voice writers. And there's really fabulous machine writers. And there are, pardon me, crappy machine writers and they're crappy voice writers. I don't care how you get it down there. That's your, that's your choice. But some t I know, I have talked to voice writers, and I've talked to voice writers who were machine writers, and vice versa, and they have confirmed to me, whoa, I have to work twice as hard as a voice writer to get the same translation. I have to work twice as hard. That's it. They didn't say they couldn't do it, all right? Did that answer? Okay. Because I know it's a, it's a choice. I will tell you that I think percentage-wise, there are probably more machine writers in the United States than voice writers at this point in time. Don't know if that will change. And I don't know that that's better or worse. It's just the way it is. And there are still companies who will not hire voice writers because somehow they think, 
and I, 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 I've tried so long, and we just got our associations to merge here in Georgia. I, am, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that we're all going to be together, because that's how we're going to last. That's how we're going to make this happen, is if we all stand together. This, this fighting we've been doing for 40 years is just, to me, it's just crazy, but, but it happens. So you guys join Join the state association, okay? Join your national associations. Join NCRA. Join NVRA. It, it's cheap when you're a student. You you can afford it. It's not, it's not that much. It costs a lot once you are 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 working. But join your associations, and 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 there's so much great knowledge. Um, I'm back on the board again. Hi. I thought I was off the board a few years ago, but. We've been having some issues, and so they asked a few of us uh, more mature, seasoned people to come back and help right this ship again. So I don't know. I'm, a, I'm along for the ride again. So, but I've always, I joined my state association when I, immediately when I got out of school. And before I got out of school, I was a member of NCRA, before I got out of school. I don't know why. It's just I, I, I chose to, and it really paid off. Okay, what other questions do you have about captioning or core reporting? Uh, well, oh, hi, Burton. I forgot you had a question. I forgot all about you. I'm sorry. You're just so quiet. Uh, two, two questions. Yeah, we're going to do the frame. Sorry. Um, you know, so with the I often hear how captioning, uh, card and captioning is like a higher level degree of court reporting, I guess, to say. In your opinion, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but if you do, in your opinion, what makes being a card capture training on a higher level? Um, and then part two of that is that if you decide to go into the card capturing field, where should, what, what is your thought process of where a beginner should start? In there? Not going straight to broadcasting or not going straight to this, but where should they start? Uh, really that the level of the level of difficulty maybe is one step up because everything we do is real time live. We have one chance. I don't get to go back and fix it tomorrow. I don't get to go back and take care of that word I didn't hear. Or, and I have an obligation to my consumer, in my humble opinion, to give them as much correct information as possible, correct and complete, because I'm listening for them. And if I miss something, they miss something. So I feel a big responsibility to my consumer. I'm providing a service. As a core reporter, I, yeah, I provided a service, but I was giving a booklet to somebody. That's what I was doing. I was part of the judicial system. I was a cog in the judicial system. I am now providing a service to folks who really need me. I, I am, I'm, you know, I'm doing an important job, and I, I, I love that part of it. But I think the difficulty comes that everything is live. We don't, and we don't get do-overs. So that means you've really got to be on your toes. You've got to be well trained. And as far as where you start in the captioning world, you start with being trained. That's where you start. You get training. You you go to someone's class. You you go to the NCRA uh, uh, workshop. But you have formal training, whether it's with an individual who has a formal training program or if it's with a class online or in bricks and mortar, but you get specific training because there is so much about captioning that is so different from judicial reporting. You don't, you don't know what you don't know. And when you start out from that, it doesn't mean you, you have a lack of knowledge. I mean, it doesn't mean like you're stupid. It means you don't even know what you don't know. And once you start being told the things that you need to know, you go, I had, I had no idea. That's usually the biggest aha moments or when I start training people who are, you know, retraining court reporters and they go, well, I had no idea. You know, some people just go, well, I think, you know what, I'm getting ready to retire. I think I'll just caption. Really? Well, oh, okay. Or I, I think I just want to be a captioner. Um, how quick can I start? Huh. Well, gee, I don't know. That's like saying I want to be a court reporter. How quick can I start? Well, I don't know. Where are you in your journey of, of being able to write 98% accurate, writing 98% accurate um, pretty much 100% of the time? I don't know. 
So it's, it's getting your skill up to a certain level and then taking captioning specific training, in my humble opinion. And then when you go to companies, every company, any company you go to as an independent contractor or even as an employee, they're going to test you. And you need, know, you need to know how to pass that test. And it's not always that you got every single word that was spoken. It's were you able to hook up to their platform for them to see the captioning. They give you instructions on stream text. Well, you're like, what's that? Well, you need to know what it is, and you need to know how to make your captions come out. That's part of the whole thing. And you weren't able to write that whole thing verbatim because it was too fast. What do you do now? Well, as a core reporter, what do you do? Sorry. You're going to need to slow down. Y'all can't talk at the same time. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. Whatever it takes to make a record. I'm making a record here. I'm going to need you to cooperate with me. In my world, I don't get to stop anybody. I just have to deal with what they give me. Well, what do I do? I can't try to write every word if I know it's not going to translate. I can't write a word if I know in my head. It, like if I don't have the name Burton in my dictionary and somebody says Burton, I don't get to just stroke it out and fix it later. That's what you do in your world, right? You are verbatim. The word says spoken. What do you do? When they say a word, you, you write it. You write the word. That's your job. That's not my job. So those are the kinds of things that you need to know. Does that all make sense? Um, yes. I think that's a choice. I think that's a personal choice. You know, some people can't come out of school and start doing some retraining. You want? You need a paycheck. I need to be a core person. Sorry. It's going to have to wait. I have spent my life savings on this school. I've been in here three years. I need a paycheck. I can't start, you know. So you going out to be a judicial reporter is totally not a waste of time. There's nothing you can do in that field that's going to hold you back from being a captioner. So it's going to be a personal choice. You can, or you can work as a court reporter and train at the same time if you can do that. Everybody's at a different place in their lives. Some people have a lot of responsibilities and they need to have income. Other folks, not so much. Somebody's helping them out or they have somebody they can, that can help support them and they're able to do some more training. But that, it's, there's not, I don't think, in my opinion, that there is a right or wrong answer to that. Some people will tell you you cannot go directly into captioning from school. I have heard that. I don't believe that. I know people who did. I know plenty of people who did that very thing. They were never a judicial reporter, ever. They're great captioners. So whatever you want to do. That wasn't much help probably, but, but you, get, you get to figure it out for yourself. And, and then you talk to somebody about what it might look like for you. You, know, you call me and you say, okay, I'm here in school, but I do recommend your finishing school and graduating. Not finishing school and getting almost graduated. And this school is not here to take your money. They are here to make court reporters. The decisions they make are not based on whether they can get more money out of you. I don't, can't tell you how many times over the years I heard that. This is not one of those places. This place has been in business, well, as you see, over 40 years, good reputation. They are not here to keep you in school so you can pay them more. That's not their point. Their point is to make good court reporters. In my opinion, I hope that you guys are taking that to the next level and becoming real-time writers, okay? And I want, you, I want you voice writers to be real-time writers too. I don't want you to take shortcuts. I don't want you to go into voice writing because you can get out quicker because that's simply not true if you're going to be a real-time writer. It's going to take everybody a long time to be a real-time writer, okay? A question here and then your question. No, you had your hand up before she did a while ago.
Uh, Great question. We get paid by the hour. There are no pages in our lives. That's that we don't deal in pages. We deal in hours. So I get paid for the hours that I actually work. Like if my sh if my class that I do is 50, a 50 minute class, I'll get paid for an hour. Okay. If it's an hour and 20 minutes, I'll get paid for an hour and a half. We, we go by 15 minute increments. So I get paid for the hours that I'm actually writing. Okay. Uh, the work that I do, the the research that I do before I do my work, that is not paid for, nor should it be, in my opinion. That's part of your job. Why, why do they need to pay you extra if you're going to write well? Now, you can pay me this much, or if you pay me this much, more of the words will be right. Yeah, that's not a good business model. Right? Uh-huh, that's not a good idea. And you're, you're going to prep for a different amount of time than I am. I don't have pages afterwards. I do all my work before. I ask for information and I use that information. Um, but what I do is I get paid enough per hour to make it more than worth my while to do whatever prep I need to do. And it will vary. It's going to vary by job, how much you get paid. It could be there's a big range of probably, and this is a guess, of between like 55 to $120 an hour. In, that's a big range, but there's a lot of different reasons why there is a range, okay? And when I go on site, I get paid by the day or the half day. And when I go on site, because I have an hour for lunch, you don't get to take out that hour in the middle of my day. Um, it's from when I show up to when I leave, okay? And sometimes it's a day rate, and sometimes it's an hourly rate. Um, and if I have a class in the morning, an 8 o'clock class, online, remotely, I'm at home, and you're, you, the student, don't show up, that's your right. You don't have to show up. The hearing students don't have to show up if they don't want to. But if you don't show up, I still get paid. So you can just not show up all semester. That's fine with me. You can just not show up all day long. Works for me. And if you cancel me within 24 hours, you're still going to pay me. Unless I go on site. And then you've got to cancel me 48 hours. And if you only have me scheduled till 2 o'clock and 2 o'clock hits, and I have something else, guess what I get to do? Bye bye Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Well, I just have one. Bye-bye. Got to go. Sorry. You know what? You want me till 3? You need to schedule me till 3. Now, I'll give you, I usually, usually you don't walk out at 2.01. But if you schedule, some people schedule themselves very tightly, and you don't get longer than 10 minutes. And then, I'm sorry, got, I got to go. So what I hear on the phone with these business meetings is, we need to hurry up because we're losing our captioner. Yeah, you are. Yes, you are, because we got about two more minutes. And then she's dropping off because I'm going to move on. Okay? So that is, that's very different than the judicial world. The judicial world, you show up to a depot, and it cancels, you get to charge an appearance fee. Sorry. And if they cancel you the day before, you don't get anything. Um, and if they don't want, you know, if they don't want to buy the transcript, no transcript. But if they do, you might get, you know, an 0 and 5 or an 0 and 10, and you're like, yeah, hey. Um, and you don't get to walk out when you're done. When they say, you know, we want you at 12, they don't give you any time, do they? No. They never go, we want you 12 to 2. They go, we want you at 12, because guess how long you might be there? Who knows? You could be there till midnight. Honey, could you pick up the kids? Sorry. Stuck again. I have just one more question. Oh, great. But on TV, the show's end. Classes, the students walk out. They have to go to their next class. Business meetings, people need to go to the next business meeting, okay? Trainings, people don't hold you over when you go to training, right? Okay, am I over my time? Did I? How much time do I have allotted? Y'all, I have eight minutes. See, okay. What other questions do you have? Hi. I'm just going to ask you, at this point in your career, how often do you practice now? I don't practice at all because I work every day. I don't need practice. I'm writing every day. And the truth is, I was never a practicer. There are people who's been, who've been reporting as long as I have, and they'll practice every day. I didn't practice when I was in school. Seriously, I didn't. I'm not telling you that's, don't get me wrong, that's not the answer. 
No, that's not, that's not the answer. I, I, that's what I did. They had to make me practice. I don't like, because I, you know, I, I just, I'm, that's not who I am. I just didn't practice as much as I should because that's just who I am. I was lucky I, have, I was a piano player. And, I, and I, so I had some natural ability coming in behind me. Um, so that kind of helped carry me. But you've got to remember, I went to school 40 years ago. I didn't have nearly as much to learn as you guys did. We didn't have computers, m computer machines. We didn't have real time. We didn't have automatic translation. I just needed to get something on that paper in front of me so I could dictate it. So a human could type it for me. I, I didn't, don't even, and you're like, what? Like I would drive across town to meet my typist at 6.30 in the morning from, to Covington, and we'd meet at the McDonald's, and I'd give her cassette tapes, and she would give me pages. What? I mean, the whole thing was like crazy. So I didn't have as much to learn either. All I had to do was just write on that machine pretty much, and I took medical terminology, anatomy and physiology, legal terminology, and all of those kinds of things. But we didn't, you know, it's a, it's a longer process now. But I don't practice because... Well, I've been on the machine 41 years, so some mornings I feel like when I start out, I'm a little cold, and I think, well, I probably could have warmed up a bit. We call it warming up now. I don't warm up. I'm the, yeah. Not, not recommended. It's just who I am. Just being honest. Part of who I am. Uh, anybody? Any more questions? You ladies are so quiet. Okay. Okay. Um. So if, what do you have to do, or are you the contact person if you're a fund graduation or before graduation for the training? Everybody has my number. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you. Yeah, either I'll have a training or I will tell you who to go to. Yeah. How long is that? Depends. I don't know. I don't know where your level of skill is when, when you come into the training. I don't know what your real time looks like. It's going to depend. First thing it's going to depend on is where are you in your real time? Are you a machine or voice? Okay, so, so what percentage translation do you have? I don't know. So, and, and, then, and then what you do is you work with somebody who can tell you and, and narrow it down so that you don't do a bunch of work you don't need to do. It's very... It's, sometimes very specific and you definitely as a voice writer need to work with a voice writer for that training I wish I could train you I can't I, I it you would waste your money we all learn somewhat the same things but then we branch off and the machine is so different from voice writing the nuances and things you need to know okay and then you had a question okay start writing I mean, so my phone number is 678-557-4354. That goes for you guys out in IT land. Uh, my email is H-C-T-H-O-M. Do not finish my last name. Don't put Thomas, okay? It's T-H-O-M. Stop there. It's going to go to my friend Heather somewhere else. And the number two at gmail.com. HC, that's my middle initial, HCTHOM2 at gmail.com. Okay? Um, well, thank you guys for letting me come and speak to you. And um, keep going. We really need you. I, really, seriously. Like, really badly. <laughs>